chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is the topic. And COPD essentially comprises two components. There's chronic bronchitis, and then there is emphysema. Now, chronic bronchitis is essentially a presentation of productive cough on a chronic basis. Whereas emphysema is talking more about the destruction of the lung, parenchyma. And what that can do over time is it can cause the lung to be hyperinflated. And this is due to the air being trapped inside. So keep those two components in mind. In terms of etiology, the most common reason that a person can develop COPD is because of the smoking. And there is a genetic component to COPD as well. In terms of pathophysiology, there's some key components to COPD that you need to know. The first one, of course, is inflammation of the airways. The next one is bronchoconstriction. In addition to these two, there is a hallmark of COPD. And this is detected on diagnostic tests that I will talk about a little later. And that is airflow limitation. Essentially, it's very difficult for a person with COPD to exhale with a maximal uh, effort. And the PFTs, the pulmonary function tests, will demonstrate that. Another thing is airway obstruction. And this happens because of all the mucus and edema that can collect in the airways. In addition, in acute exacerbations, COPD can lead to bacterial infection and this is an important thing to mention because it will dictate how it is treated and it is treated with antibiotics if this happens. So keep these key pathophysiology aspects in mind. In terms of symptoms, well on a clinical vignette, part of the history will almost always include smoking. But symptoms, of course, include difficulty breathing, wheezing, uh, on physical exam, a barrel chest, which essentially is an increased anterior-posterior diameter of the thorax. Cough. A productive cough is often found if there is a strong bronchitis component to the COPD. So now let's talk about the diagnosis. First uh, test is a chest x-ray and this will show hyperinflation of the lung and that will be seen on the chest x-ray as a flat diaphragm since the lung is essentially compressing the diaphragm. There's so much air inside. Now the key test to diagnosing COPD is the spirometry or PFTs which are pulmonary function tests. Now the pulmonary function test is going to be measuring some key components and those key components are as follows FEV1, FVC, and the ratio between these two and I'll explain what each of these are. Now FEV1 is the volume of air that is forcefully expired in the first second of the exhale. FEV1 stands for forced expiratory volume in one second. FVC, which is forced vital capacity, is the total volume of air that is expired with maximum force. And then of course you have the ratio. Now in COPD 
the FEV1 will be decreased. Now how much decreased? That depends on the level of severity. And the ratio will also be decreased. It will be less than 0.7. Now the hallmark of COPD is that you have a decreased forced expiratory effort. So keep that in mind. There's one more lab test I wanted to mention very briefly that might show up is in COPD your hematocrit will be very high, sometimes as high as um, 50, and that essentially is known as polycythemia. Sometimes they mention that on clinical vignettes. So now let's get into the final part, which is treatment. And before I get into all the medications, I want to write in the corner here something that's very important, and that is smoking cessation. That should definitely be part of the treatment. So now let's break this up into three categories. Patient group, the findings, and of course the treatment. Now, we're going to break this up into three categories. You have mild COPD, you have moderate COPD, and then of course you have severe COPD. Now the findings that will characterize which category is the FEV1. If it's greater than or equal to 80% of predicted value, it's known as mild. If the FEV1 is essentially between 50 and 79%, then it's moderate. And if the FEV1 is less than 50%, it's considered severe. So what are the medications? First, I'll write the abbreviations and then I'll explain what each of these are. So I have SABA plus SAC, which is short-acting beta agonist plus a short-acting cholinergic. And then you have LABA, which is a long-acting beta agonist. And then finally, the last medication is known as a in ICS, which is inhaled corticosteroid. So let's go through this. S-A-B-A, what's that? Short-acting beta agonist. And an example of that is very famous albuterol. So that is, of course, an, inha an inhaler. S-A-C is short-acting anticholinergic. And an example of that is hypertropium. Now, when you say SABA plus SAC, basically it's a combination. So it's these two medications given in one, and that is known as Comavent. And that is, of course, a brand name, but the generic names are albuterol plus hypertropium. So that takes care of mild. But what about moderate? Well, moderate, you keep the Comavent, but then you add. LABA. Well, what's LABA? Well, that's long-acting beta agonist. And an example of that is salmeterol. So you would add salmeterol to the treatment plan. And then finally, severe, you keep your combivant, but then you add LABA plus ICS. ICS is inhaled corticosteroid. And an example of an inhaled corticosteroid is fluticasone. So you would give a, a long-acting beta agonist with an inhaled corticosteroid. So you'd give salmeterol with fluticasone and that is Advair. Advair is an inhaler that contains both salmeterol and fluticasone. So that is essentially a very simple, very structured way of remembering the treatment plan. So let's take a look at some vignettes. 67-year-old comes to the office complaining of a 12-month history of shortness of breath at rest with mild exertion. He also reports wheezing that seem to correspond to the times when he is most out of breath. 
He has cough that is persistent most of the year and occasionally productive of scant sputum. He has a long smoking history of over a hundred packs a year. He has recently quit. His only other medical history is hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Chest x-ray shows hyperinflation, but clear lung fields, and no evidence of parenchymal or mediastinal mass. The most appropriate next step is. Well, let's go through these. Obtain spirometry, meaning do the PFTs. Yes, definitely. CT of the chest in ter terms of the next step, a little too expensive there. Uh, prescribe albuterol or corticosteroids. That might be, but we don't know that yet. We have to do the PFTs first. So the answer for that would be A. Next question. 67-year-old man comes to the clinic for annual visit. He and his wife have just moved to the area from out of state. He brought along his medical records, which showed that he has a hypertension, PVD, and that he carries the diagnosis of emphysema. He tells you that he smokes one pack of cigarettes per day, but refrains from all but social alcohol. His medications include Thizag, Captopril, Quinine, and Albuterol inhalers as needed. He has never had a pulmonary function test. Temperature is 98, blood pressure is 135, pulse is 72, respirations are 14. He has diffuse bilateral expiratory wheezes and a mild prolonged expiratory time. Abdomen is obese, but non-tender, is no fluid wave. The most appropriate intervention for this patient is well, let's go through these. Change captopril to lisinopril. I don't know what that's going to do. Encourage him to quit smoking immediately. That's a very good one. Increase his thiazide diuretic or initiate home oxygen therapy. See, he doesn't really, his blood pressure is normal, so I don't know why he'd increase that. So it's between B or D. D, we don't know yet because he's never had a pulmonary function test. So we need to do that if his FEV one was perhaps less than 30, then maybe you would consider oxygen therapy. But for now, the best thing for him to do and the best advice to give him is to quit smoking. Next question. 72-year-old male with COPD comes to the emergency department with acute exacerbation marked by increased sputum production and shortness of breath. His oxygen is 88 on room air and he has diffuse inspiratory and expiratory wheezes bilaterally. In addition to oxygen and bronchodilators, which of the following is the most appropriate for this patient? Now remember, this is an exacerbation. Exacerbations, uh, and he also has sputum, that can lead to bacterial infection. It's part of the pathophysiology. So you definitely should add antibiotics. And to decrease inflammation in acute exacerbations, definitely add corticosteroids. So the answer to this question would be D. And then finally, a 52-year-old female sees you for the first time to establish care for stable COPD. Since losing her insurance four months ago, she has been off all medications except for a short-acting bronchodilator. She stopped smoking two years ago. She has frequent chronic cough and is dyspneic while climbing stairs. PFT reveals a FEV1 of 55%. O2 saturation is 90%. In addition to the short-acting inhaled bronchodilator, recommended maintenance that monotherapy for this patient would be either an inhaled long-acting anticholinergic agent or an inhaled what? Well, her FEV1 is 55%, so she's in the moderate category. And for moderate CAPD, they recommend a short-acting beta agonist plus a short-acting cholinergic medication. And the question's already told you about that. So she's already got the short-acting bronchodilator, which is the short-acting beta agonist. And they're saying either a short, either a long-acting anticholinergic agent, or well, long or short, depending on severity. The key thing is that it's an anticholinergic agent. Or an inhaled what? Well, in moderate COPD, in addition to these drugs that are listed here, the short-acting beta agonist and the anticholinergic agent, you also give a long-acting beta agonist, and that would be choice B. And an example of a long-acting beta agonist is salmeterol.